One, why psychology? A brief history. In this segment, I'll tell you about the philosophical origin of psychology, its history, its many different disciplines. So if psychology is a child, this section will tell you about its birth. The term psychology comes from Greek. Psyche means mind or soul and logi meaning the study of. Psychology simply means the study of the mind. Psychology has been with humans since the dawn of time, but it was part of philosophy. Historically speaking, philosophy, at least Greek philosophy, was concerned with three main subjects. The physical world of matter, the origin of life, and the human mind. Today, the physical world of matter is studied in physics and chemistry, while biology deals with life. The human mind has become the domain of psychology, so philosophy encompassed all of them. Now you might ask, why do we humans have philosophy in the first place? The simple answer is the awareness of death gave rise to philosophical probing to understand what's the meaning of life and how the world works and how we know about reality. So you can say that the main reason we have psychology basically goes back to our awareness of death and the human condition. As animals, we evolved to develop consciousness, self-consciousness, which gave us the ability to anticipate our own death long before death itself. It is terrifying to know that we all die. There has to be a reason behind death. Thus, we invented religions and stories to give death a meaning and console ourselves with the afterlife as another realm. So afterlife is nothing but a convenient answer to the terrifying ordeal of death. So the invention of gods and demons were in a way to numb that existentialist crisis. Believing that there is a heaven, a perfect utopia waiting for us, gives us a bit of comfort. Now let's talk about early psychological questions within philosophy. The early psychologists were partly philosophers and partly physicians who were tackling the same questions we face today. How come individuals have different personalities and tendencies or behaviors? When you open a new computer or smartphone, you do not expect it to be different from other computers or smartphones of the same model. But humans come in many external forms such as height and shape, but also internal forms such as personality and mood. The first pioneers of psychology were the ancient Greeks and Romans. The first true school of psychology is called humorism. It's not a comedy club, but a psychological analysis of human personality types. Humorism. The Greek physician Hippocrates, who lived between 460 and 370 BC, has given us the Hippocratic Oath and Medicine, in which doctors promise to do no harms to anyone. Hippocrates thought the body contained fluids or humor that healed itself. In other words, the human body had properties such as earth, air, fire, and water that made it capable of healing itself. He allowed his patients to rest to allow the body's healing mechanism to kick in. Today we might call it easing one's body during sickness, which allows the patients to get better by themselves. Or it could be simply the immune system that fights viruses and illnesses. Of course, Hippocrates also prescribed drugs, but his approach was a baby step in psychological treatment of easing one from their burdens and letting them rest. A few centuries later, the Roman physicians Claudius Galen, who lived between 129 and 201 AD, developed the humorist approach further by arguing that humans have four distinct personalities, depending on the level of humor, such as earth, water, air, and fire in their body. In other words, if you had one element more, your personality shifted in that direction more. So the human body for him was like a cooked meal with many ingredients and each with different volumes and proportions could determine your personality type. His personality types were sanguine, the cheerful type, phlegmatic, the quiet type, choleric, the passionate type, and finally melancholic, the artistic type. These personalities are caused by the imbalance in humor and often from birth. But he argued that one can encounter or limit the excess of these temperaments by eating certain food or through physical exercise. 
Today, we use energy drinks, alcohol, drugs, and so forth to become more cheerful, energetic, and so forth. Too much energy? Exercise to tire yourself. Most people who go to gym would tell you that exercising has a direct impact on their mood. If you feel depressed, do a good workout and you might feel much better. So Galen knew this 2,000 years ago. So he thought human personality was like a cooked meal. The taste depended heavily on the amount of each ingredient. Socrates, the father of Western philosophy, shifted the focus from body to the mind. For him, the happy person was the one who discovered his true self. He developed his questioning method through which one asks a series of questions in order to get to the bottom of a problem. This approach is in how modern science analyzes something to understand its property. So Socrates used a series of questions to determine what true self was. He employed reason to understand what's going on. So he concluded that virtue was the ultimate goal of a person and being good meant the person had discovered his true self, which should make you happy. A virtuous man is not only a good man, but also a happy man. The reason I use masculine pronouns here is that back then, these philosophers were mainly talking about men. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher who came after Socrates, lived between 384 and 322 BC, came up with four ways that we can be happy. Through sensual pleasures, i.e. sex, material possession, ethical superiority, and logical understanding. Today, we all try to maximize these pleasures, so nothing has really changed since the ancient times. Hindu Psychology In ancient India, two collections of texts were extremely important. The Vedas are a collection of texts that concern sociological issues such as religion and politics, but there was another group of texts that mainly focused on the individual's inner journey. These texts are called the Upanishads. In other words, the Vedas had an external or worldly outlook, while the Upanishads had a more internal and personal outlook. Generally speaking, the Vedas have a more social message, while the Upanishads have a more individual message. The Upanishads, written about 2,700 years ago, contain many religious and philosophical ideas and doctrines, but it also contains some deeply psychological insights into the human mind. One of the central themes of the Upanishads is the relation between the self, which is nothing but illusion, and the greater self, which is the real self or spirit or consciousness. Arthur Schopenhauer's psychological philosophy was deeply influenced by the Upanishads. So he argued that within us, this will to life force motivates us to do things almost subconsciously. For example, our urge for sex, for instance, is part of this blind will within us. According to Upanishad, Jiva is the visible self and Atman is the hidden true self. Our life's purpose is to fully understand and realize Atman in order to reach Moksha and escape from the cycle of reincarnation. In other words, a kind of self-actualization process to achieve inner bliss, not through faith but through active level of consciousness. In other words, knowing deeper layers of human mind can help us escape our human condition. The Upanishads divide consciousness into three stages awake, asleep, and higher consciousness. Most of us experience the first two states. During the waking hours, we are conscious of what's going on around us. During sleep, we lose that ability as our consciousness shut down temporarily. But the third state of consciousness, or Turiya, is only attained through rigorous contemplation and meditation and most importantly, through high level of awareness in which we are actually conscious of the inner self or Atman. In some Upanishad texts, consciousness is divided into four states in which sleep is in turn divided into two, light sleep and deep sleep. And the primary force of life is consciousness. In today's world, meditation, or more specifically yoga, a very old Indian tradition, is used to treat people with psychological problems. Another important element of Upanishads is the relationship between the mind and nature. In Hindu philosophies, humans are not only from nature, but we are nature. 
there is no separation between humans and other animals. This closeness to nature brings a level of humility. We're not special. So according to Upanishads, our life's goal is to attain enough knowledge and consciousness through rigorous meditation and self-actualization so we realize Atman, the eternal, timeless state of bliss. Islamic World The next development in philosophical psychology took place in the Islamic world where philosophers and physicians combined Greek philosophy and medicine with Indian philosophy and medicine to give it a new flavor as we know today as Islamic Golden Age. These Muslim philosophers were very keen on the understanding of consciousness between the individual consciousness and the universal consciousness. Islam as a religion has a deeply universalistic outlook, so these philosophers were very keen to find ways to explain the human psyche from a universalistic perspective. Most of these philosophers were reacting to Aristotle's natural philosophy and tried to reconcile the scientific method with Islamic universal soul. In other words, the animalistic with the divine perfection, so to speak. In Indian philosophy, it's like the ladder that reaches nirvana. Farabi, who lived between 870 and 950, believed that there are two levels of consciousness. The individual, which is internal, like knowing what we know, which is similar to self-consciousness. And active consciousness, which allows us to be receptive to external stimuli, which allows us to expand on our internal consciousness. This is somewhat similar to Immanuel Kant's rational philosophy, that we not only have innate knowledge, but we also have our mental structure that allows us to categorize external knowledge. So Farabi divided intellectual consciousness into two, the individual, which is subjective, and the active, which is universal and objective, which seeks and receives external knowledge, somewhat similar to Carl Jung's active imagination. In other words, unlike other animals, we have the rational ability to discriminate, to make moral choices. He also attributed our choices based on our internal organs like heart, brain, and liver. And the level of heat they contain determine our level of aggression. For example, men are more aggressive because our heart contains more heat compared to women who are more compassionate. Ibn Sina, or Avicenna as he is commonly known in the West, who lived between 980 and 1037, was a multi-talented man. He was a philosopher, a doctor, a psychologist, and a theologian. His famous thought experiment of floating man predates René Descartes' I think therefore I am a mind-body dualism by almost 600 years. In floating man, Avicenna imagines a man free-falling or suspended in air with his limbs and body not touching any object. Would he know he exists? In other words, if we had no senses like touch, smell, hearing, sight, taste, would we know we exist? His answer was that yes, we would still know our existence without the help of our body. His conclusion was that the mind is separate from the body. Ibn Rushd or Aviros, as he is commonly known in the West, lived between 1126 and 1198. He too tried to reconcile the body with the soul. His approach is somewhat similar to Plato in that form gives rise to matter, not the other way around, which is contrary to modern science that matter is primary and consciousness is secondary. His argument was that the active consciousness or active intellect becomes individual consciousness within a particular human body. In other words, the soul is universal but becomes individual within each human being. So the spiritual consciousness becomes the material consciousness when it occupies a human body or a container, so to speak. However, once this material consciousness acquired enough knowledge of the world, it has the chance to become greater than the body and rise up to become a universal consciousness that can become immortal, somewhat similar to the Buddhist nirvana. For example, if knowledge is perfected through our senses, it ultimately becomes a universal sense or common sense that lives on. His philosophy was more focused on the material side of life to the point that he thought the Islamic promise of sensual pleasures, i.e. virgins in afterlife, was a better motivator to do good in this life compared to the Christian promise of spirituality in the afterlife. In other words, we humans find material or physical pleasures far more enticing than spiritual pleasures. 
This was the first seeds of materialism that arrived in Europe to transform science and philosophy and ground everything on the material world rather than spiritual or metaphysical realms. In other words, his emphasis on the practical side of intellect and knowledge brought sciences and religion together. However, the Islamic world ignored his pragmatism and dived deeper into spirituality, but this practical intellectual endeavor found itself a new home in Europe. Also important to note that Averroes was born and lived most of his life in Islamic Spain, within the continental Europe, so he was perfectly placed to bridge Islamic world with a Christian Europe. Renaissance Europe European scholars and scientists read and absorbed Islamic philosophy and science, and also through the works of Islamic scholars, they reconnected with the Greek philosophy and science. It gave rise to what is called the scientific revolution in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. Now, faith and religion were severely challenged by a new empirical and practical science that studied the world through a rigorous scientific method. Galileo, Copernicus, and Newton were the pioneers of material science which became the basis of modernity. As science became more sophisticated in Europe and people learned a great deal about the natural world, some scientists turned their attention to solving the mystery of the human mind. It's like the scientists turn their microscope on themselves. The most famous Renaissance philosopher and scientist who tackled the mind was René Descartes, whose famous thought experiment of 1649 gave us the most famous line in philosophy. To prove that we exist, he imagined nothing existed. Then he concluded that at least the person who imagines or doubts or thinks this idea of non-existence has to exist. So I think, therefore I am, became the most famous line in philosophy. Descartes also believed that mind and body were two separate entities, which today is known as Cartesian dualism. But around this time, there was another huge shift in Europe. With the advancement of sciences and discoveries, people's belief in God and religion was shaken. Many scientific discoveries, including Copernicus and Galileo arguing that we are orbiting the sun, not the other way around, contradicted the religious view of the world. That solid belief in the supreme God ruling the world was severely challenged. For thousands of years, humans relied on gods protecting them and offering them refuge in heaven like children who rely on their parents for protection and comfort. This soft, protective, loving environment is also created by God in heaven. When you die, you return to your childhood. But now science is busting a lot of religious myths. Santa is not real. This godless vacuum created a psychological shift as people no longer believed there was a God protecting them from the tragedies of life. This era, 18th and 19th century, is also called the Enlightenment or waking up to the idea that rationality is the only true supreme power we have. The belief in the divine power didn't seem too convincing, at least among the intellectuals and elites of Europe. This freedom from God came with a huge responsibility. Now, your reason or rationality was the only weapon against life's tragedies. While rationality is an amazing tool to make our physical life better through technology and medicine, it provides very little when it comes to our psychological happiness or fulfillment in life. While the majority of the poor struggled with life, toiling in the physical pain of not having enough to eat, the rich Europeans, however, had a different problem. They believed that once you have enough wealth, you would be happy turned out not to be true. Some of the rich Europeans had miserable lives. What was going on? Science could help you with physical pain, but it couldn't help you with mental pain and psychological suffering. So people started asking questions and probing into the human mind to understand why we suffer. Early Pioneers One of the earliest philosophers who tackled the question of suffering was Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher today nicknamed as the Great Pessimist. His 1819 book, The World as Will and Representation, revolutionized philosophy, shifting the attention from religion and rationality to the human subconscious. He understood that wealth, fame, status, beauty, and all the good stuff were mere surface level, but there was a giant beast underneath it all. 
we strive to become rich, powerful, more beautiful and famous, but it's not actually us who is seeking them. It is this hidden beast inside each one of us that wants those things. The beast is using us to get wealth, fame, status, beauty and all the objects of desire. But who is this beast? Why do we never see it? Schopenhauer articulated the beast as the blind will that rules every one of us. Not just us, the, this will rules all beings and the whole universe. The will doesn't belong to you or me, it has its own agenda. It merely uses us to achieve its goal. Goal? Actually, the blind will has no goal, it has no shape, it has no limit. It's like a bottomless well. Schopenhauer argued that we cannot see the will and all we understand about the world is a mere representation of that will. He called it will to life. Deeply instinctual and we subconsciously follow what this will wills. I should point out that this notion of hidden blind will was very much part of Eastern philosophy for thousands of years. But what's remarkable about Schopenhauer was that he articulated so well that it made sense for the Europeans who were highly rationalistic in their approach. It's no surprise that the first psychology lab was created in Germany, so Schopenhauer's influence on psychology is massive. But before I tell you about the first psychology lab, there was one more massive development in Europe. In 1859, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection revolutionized science and philosophy, but also severely shook the foundation of religious beliefs. Again, I think Darwin must have read or have been influenced by Schopenhauer directly or indirectly. And Darwin's evolutionary theory gives scientists more freedom and leeway to probe into the human mind because we are evolved animals after all. Since we are evolved animals, then our psyche can be studied just like other animals. It's no longer only the domain of God and church. So in the late 19th century, psychology became a new field of study in Europe. Universities opened their psychology departments to understand psychological illnesses that were on the rise. But also the human mind was a new frontier and a mysterious place that attracted a lot of young men to explore. 19th century Europe was the age of exploration. Some people like Darwin traveled around the world in search of new discoveries and some stayed in their labs to discover what was going on inside the human mind. As psychology started to grow, three different psychological approaches emerged, the German, Russian and Anglo-American. In Germany, psychology was part of the science faculty, mainly medicine, while in the Anglo-Saxon world, psychology departments were considered under philosophy. The Germans took an analytical approach, breaking things down to its smaller parts like a machine or car to understand how it works. While the Anglo-Saxon preferred a more theoretical approach, understanding the bigger picture, the sum, not the parts. Perhaps due to the British and American psyche of ruling the entire world through the British Empire and American domination. As a result, the German approach falls under psychoanalysis tradition while the American falls under cognitive psychology and the Russian focused on behavioral psychology. Of course, I'm making generalizations here. You can find exceptions within each of these three traditions. Science works in generalization. In 1879, the first psychology lab was created by Wilhelm Wundt at the University of Leipzig in Germany. He used himself as a lab rat to analyze how the human mind worked. He took a Tolstoyan approach. To understand something, we have to go back in history, event by event, until you reach the origin. His approach was like finding the source of the Nile, so you have to search for its tributaries and smaller parts. Wundt's conclusion was that the human mind starts at birth and as we grow, it becomes more and more complex as it matures. I'll discuss his psychology in more detail later on. Around the same time in 1890s, Ivan Pavlov, a Russian physiologist, took a more scientific approach by experimenting on animals. He concluded that animals can be conditioned to behave in certain ways. For example, you can train animals like dogs by giving them treats. His research paved the way for a new school of psychology called behaviorism. The old adage that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but you can certainly train a puppy by exposing it to certain conditions and it will behave in the way you want. 
the nature versus nurture debate has always been with us. So Pavlov emphasized that the environment has a huge role in how we behave. While both Wund and Pavlov were white gown lab scientists, there were a lot of armchair psychologists who were replacing the old school church confessions with psychotherapy or the so-called talking cure. Before psychotherapy, if you had psychological baggage, you would go to your church pastor and make a confession to unburden yourself. But in the 19th century, people turned to doctors and psychotherapists. One of the most famous of these, of course, is Sigmund Freud, often called the father of psychotherapy. Unlike Wundt and Pavlov, who worked in their labs, Freud drew on his own observation of real people, mainly his own patients. So he was in the field, so to speak, and concluded that there was something far deeper than what we can see. He came up with a new realm of consciousness, which he called the unconscious, where we hide our traumatic childhood memories, sexual urges. As we grow up, we suppress a lot of things inside, so expressing those memories can be cathartic. So psychotherapy or the talking cure was born. In the 1950s, after two world wars, almost everyone in the world was traumatized and beaten down, so there was a huge shift in people's mood. The USA claimed victory and Europe was turned into rubble and ashes. Also, a lot of German psychologists fled to America, first due to Nazism and later due to communism in Eastern Europe. America became the land where individuals and ideas could flourish somewhat more freely. This American individualism gave rise to a new kind of psychology, cognitive psychology. Behaviorism, psychotherapy, and psychoanalysis all lacked one key feature. While you can condition someone to behave in a certain way, you can unlock someone's traumatic past by letting them talk, but you couldn't really make people more competent or smarter to take control of their own lives. So the American cognitive psychology focused on making individuals more competent, more skilled, more robust as individuals. Cognitive psychology, a bit similar to the self-help industry, champions positive thinking and positive perception. In other words, the way you perceive something says a lot about you. Also interesting to note that cognitive psychology was born around the same time as computers. Just like computers, the study of how our mind processes information became highly important. How we understand things, solve problems, remember things, and even how to cure psychological illnesses through cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy, while not completely excluding the subconscious or environmental conditioning, puts the responsibility on the individual. Forget about your past conditioning or childhood traumas. What can you do about it now? You're not a victim, but a responsible agent who can change things. So cognitive psychology has that American optimism, which the German psychoanalysis or the Russian behaviorism lacked. With the dominance of cognitive psychology, the attention shifted to society. As decades passed, sociology, especially the French postmodernist version, grew into a robust discipline to study the role of society on the individual. So social psychology was born. Social psychology studies the group side of our psychology, how we perceive, behave in groups. So social psychologists study power dynamics, obedience, altruism, violence, and the influence of education system, all deconstructed through the French postmodern lens. With the microscope on the role of education system on individuals came child psychology, how to educate the kids in the best way. Now, all of a sudden, Freud made sense. If childhood is the most critical period in one's life, one ought to study it. Not just that, society has a duty to educate its children to become good citizens. But then came the backlash that the education system was creating uniform citizens. Why? Because while the education system has many positive sides, as it allows children the opportunity to learn, it has an extremely negative side too. It focuses too much on standard and conformity, which kills children's unique and original creative sides. We ought to celebrate differences. Then came the psychology of difference. What are the differences between the sexes? Even among different cultures and races, how can we evolve differently? 
So evolutionary psychology focuses on the history of human evolution. So to sum up, philosophy was the mother of all sciences in ancient Greece and Rome. But as humans develop more sophisticated knowledge of the world, we learn more about the natural world, philosophy became too complicated as a discipline, so it gave birth to many children, each specializing in tackling specific questions. For example, physics and chemistry took over the study of the physical world. Then in 19th century, biology took over the study of life. And then in late 19th century, early 20th century, philosophy gave birth to psychology to study the human mind. Of course, there is also a branch of biology called physiology that studies the functions of the brain and the nervous system. But the mind has become the domain of psychology in today's world. What's the difference between psychology and philosophy? The main difference between philosophy and psychology lies in the question they ask. Philosophy generally asks why questions or tries to find the reason behind ideas, thoughts, or why we have a mind in the first place. Psychology, on the other hand, asks how questions, for example, how the mind works, how thoughts and ideas come to us, and how the mind breaks down. To fully understand the two different disciplines, let's imagine Shakespeare's Hamlet holding a skull in front of him and asking questions. If Hamlet was a physiologist, he would hold the skull and ask how the stuff inside the skull, i.e. the brain matter, works on a mechanical level. If he was a philosopher, he would ask why this thing exists in the first place. Does it exist or not? If he was a psychologist, he would ask what happened to my father and damn my childhood. Joking aside, psychologist Hamlet would ask how the stuff inside this skull controls my body, my life and my behavior. So that was a brief history of psychology in the West and around the world. Of course, it has far more complexities than can be fully conveyed here. So with the invention of psychology as a separate discipline in the 19th century, it grew to become more complex with its own unique approaches, schools and ideas. The German school of psychoanalysis broke the human mind down into smaller parts, while the Russian behaviorists saw how we can be conditioned to behave in certain ways. And the American school of cognitive psychology focused on how to empower the individuals despite the handicaps of subconscious or the environmental conditioning. In the next segment, I'll answer the big question, what is psychology? And more specifically, what is consciousness? I'll discuss the various psychological approaches and branches of psychology. I'll also try to answer why we have psychology and what its main purpose is.